What's up my friends? My name is Ryan Van Duzer and welcome to my channel. In this video, I get a professional bike fit and we're gonna go through all the steps. And it's kind of crazy to think that me, a guy who's been riding his bike all his life has never had an actual professional bike fit. But I thought, you know what? After the debacle and the Tour Divide this year and the severe saddle sores, I thought maybe it's time to finally get everything dialed in. So I called up one of my very favorite bike shops here in Boulder, Colorado, Full Cycle. They are amazing. And I made an appointment with their head bike fitting guru, Ryan Ignatz. And I really just wanted to make sure that my body was happy on my bike because I sit on my bike for many hours a day when I'm out on my adventures. And the goal with this video is for it to be helpful for you as well. You're gonna learn a lot as he goes through all the aspects of a bike fit. We're talking the saddle, saddle height, your cleats, your cockpit, how you're sitting, all that good stuff. The bike that I'm getting fit on is the Priority ADX. It's the bike packing dream machine that I designed with my friends at Priority Bicycles. It's the bike that I ride on most of my adventures, and this is the one that I really want to get dialed in. So here we go. What's up, buddy? What's good up, see, Ryan? Good to see you, man. Yeah. So, bike fit day, my first time ever. Why is it important for people out there who ride their bikes a lot to get a bike fit? Yeah, I would say number one, uh, let's be comfortable. You know, if you wanna have fun out there on your bike, you've gotta be comfortable, especially as you start doing longer things like you are, then uh, definitely more important. Uh, number two would be just efficiency and power production so we can manipulate the bike and really help make you um, just optimize your, your position on the bike over the pedals so that you get the most out of your body. And then uh, sometimes for injury prevention, then we care uh, about that. Or if, if somebody has an injury, we can help work through that scenario. Ultimately, the final process is to just have fun and, uh, and really love riding your bike. I love fun. Yeah. And I don't ever want saddle sores again. Can you can you guarantee that? <laughs> yeah, I wish I could say I could guarantee no saddle sores, but uh, we do have a process or, uh, well, basically we look at lots of different saddle options because really um, everybody's anatomy is just a little different. So there are a myriad of different saddles out there and really we want to find which one works for each individual. So we'll do some pressure mapping, double check uh, sit bone width, and, uh, and test out some saddles to help. First step, uh, we're gonna measure your sit bone width. It'll help us understand how we're getting a nice platform for you on the bike. Uh, that way we're supporting your body weight well and taking weight off of your hands, your upper body, uh, as long as uh, the saddle is wide enough for your sit bones. All right, All right so basically you're gonna sit Sit up nice and tall, okay. getting your bones somewhere on that pad. Yeah, I think they're and on then, that uh, pad. You'll see here, this is uh, the pressure mapping uh, that's looking for where your sit bones are. Grab the edges and we'll oh, have okay. you pull down into it. Oh, yeah. So it'll really focalize that pressure where the bones yeah. are. All right, look at that. There's right. my sit bones. And so, look, uh, Mom. <laughs> so it looks like 117 millimeters is my sit bone width. Yep, and ideally you want the saddle to be wider than your bone width so that you're actually housed and held by that saddle. And so we're gonna double check uh, your saddle, which seems to be wide enough. So then it just comes down to, what's the shape of the saddle and is it the right shape for you and your body? So here is my seat, it's the WTB Pure. It's what comes with this bike. It's the seat I've been using on all of my rides for years. I haven't had problems until the Tour Divide. And I'm guessing it's because I was sitting on my seat for 15 hours a day and you can see just worn into it. Wear marks on the seat. That's kind of crazy, huh? Yeah. So it looks like the saddle is at a bit of a tilt, like it's been worn in, or like the rails, like there's just more body weight over onto that right side. So now it's at this angle, and you're seeing this higher focal point of pressure over on this left side. Um, yeah, maybe coinciding with some of the, the things you have going on. You might be a little more right leg dominant, you're just kind of favoring that side as well. Um, or maybe just, you know, you hit some bumps differently. Uh, out on the trail and, um, 
and it just bent the saddle rail a little bit. All right, so we're gonna double check, is your, is your saddle wide enough? So ideally, you want a saddle probably in like the 145, 150 mil width, right? And so here you are, you're at about 150. So your sit bones are 117. So they're kind of sitting, you know, right in here uh, on the sweet spot. So this rubbing might just be indicative of some of the tissue kind of rubbing, especially if you get a little bit of mud on there. Um, yeah. There was lots of mud up at Tour de Mar. Yeah, it totally. makes sense. <laughs> totally. So, so yeah, it looks like the saddle is wide enough for you and uh, definitely fits uh, you and you'll be on that saddle fully. So, you know, if it was too narrow and you were sitting off to one side, then you might put a lot of pressure on one edge or, or another just depending on um, your sit bone width, saddle width, relative nature. So, all right, let's have you pedal for me. <laughs> Love it. Alright, so what I'm going to do, Ryan, is just take a video, okay. that way we can talk it over and I'll show you what uh, parts of your fit are working well and, and other things we can improve on. We look at saddle height based on the body, and so we look at how much knee extension you have. And ideally, we don't want to be overextended at the knee or too straight, and we don't want to be too bent, right? There's some happy medium in between. Some of that happy medium depends on hamstring flexibility. Um, some of it depends on people's knees, if they have uh, cartilage damage or any other kind of knee issues. Um, but right now, we've got a nice natural amount of knee extension. So it doesn't look like uh, too extended, doesn't look uh, overly bent. So I feel like we're in a good starting place. The next thing that we pay attention to um, for a rider is where they are for aft in space. So we have the uh, ways to manipulate the saddle. Sometimes people sit forward and backward on different saddles. So uh, the way we evaluate that is we look at where's the knee joint, so this part of the knee, relative to the pedal axle um, or relative to the foot. And so in this case, uh, Ryan's knee is pretty close to right over top the pedal. If anything, he's just a touch forward. So that could mean that the more forward he is, the more body weight's falling into the handlebars and that could create some hand pressure, some numbness. Uh, so we have to be careful not letting him get too far forward. Also, it can alter which muscles are firing, whether we're getting more glute activation, more quad activation, depending on the forwardness and, and rearwardness. Um, so overall, we're really close to where he needs to be uh, to produce power well and do it efficiently and also safe for the knee. Another thing that we look at within the pedal stroke is at the 12 o'clock position, we look at how compact and how close is the knee joint and the hip joint. In this case, because he's on more of a mountain bike setup with a flat bar, he's sitting more upright, so his hip is pretty open. However, you know, he gets a little more closed than the knee, and sometimes we can change that uh, based on changing like uh, equipment like the cranks, we can change saddle height, um, depending on where he is for app, that can influence it, his ankling pattern. So we look at all those things to uh, determine the health of uh, the knee joint. Um, and in this case, things look good. He's got some downward femur angle. He's not too closed in the knee joint. Um, so he should be good to go with this crank length. If he was much uh, shorter or had a, a smaller or shorter inseam, then we may talk about changing crank lengths. Next thing that we pay attention to is what's going on with the upper body. Um, the upper body, there's a lot of variability. It depends on the bike type. What are your goals? Uh, like what symptoms you're having. That'll all be influenced by what back angle you have relative to the horizon. And then also, what is your overall reach or armpit angle here? Uh, those can all influence how much body weight we have going into our hands, whether we're trying to lock out, can we engage our core, can we look down the road and not injure our neck. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into, into that. And then also, you know, are you trying to race? Are you just trying to uh, enjoy riding for an hour um, for health and fitness, right? So all I of those- I just want to enjoy play. riding my bike day after day after day after day. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So then uh, the demands of that are different than the demands of just, uh, you know, riding for 30 minutes. Um, so we have to pay attention to neck fatigue is probably one of the bigger ones. So making sure you're not too bent over. It's different for everybody. Some people can adapt to that, some people can't. So um, in your case, 
I would say we've got a nice neutral back angle, probably why you feel very comfortable and sustainable on this bike. And then we've got a nice neutral uh, amount of weight into the hands. You've got some grips, some ergonomic grips that help uh, just minimize uh, compression of nerves that come through the palm of the hand that can get uh, numb and create um, palsy if you're on there for a long period of time like you're doing. So uh, I'd say you've got a lot of good things going on with your fit overall. That's good, right on. So uh, we've had a chance to look at Ryan's total fit. Um, and now we're gonna start with the foot pedal interface and just make sure that the foot is positioned correctly on the pedal, fore aft and even laterally. And uh, that can really help with power production. It can help with getting more glute activation, relaxation of the foot, less, less numbness in the foot. So all these things that we care about. So we're gonna mark the foot where the foot is. So we're looking for the fifth metatarsal head, which is like the little pinky joint, oh, yeah. um, right? So we're marking that. I can palpate or feel where the fifth or the first metatarsal head, which is over on this side. And you can see his metatarsals are offset a little bit. An ideal world is we want that pedal axle to fall somewhere between those, those uh, two joints. Sometimes as we go longer or if the foot gets bigger or if we're having more uh, numbness, things like that, we can actually move that pedal axle closer and more underneath or towards that fifth metatarsal head to get even more relaxation of the foot and just more even pressure into that foot. Sorry, you have to hold my stinky shoe. It still has <laughs> a lot of mud on it from the Tour Divide. Oh man, uh, it's part of that uh, dirty jobs. Uh, <laughs> one of those things you gotta do, you know? Yeah, man. Uh, so we can see here his, is where the pedal axle is in this case because he's clipped into the pedal. Um, if he was on a flat pedal, we'd still be simulating a very similar fore aft position. Um, but in this case, uh, here's that fir uh, first or fifth metatarsal head. You can see it's a little bit forward of that. We're gonna bring that pedal axle just a little closer, under closer underneath that fifth metatarsal head and see if that helps relax the foot for, for more efficiency. I'm gonna mark where your cleat uh, was just in case we have any issues or your body rejects anything that we, that we try. All bodies are slightly different, so we never know when we make a change uh, how each rider is gonna respond to it. So uh, it's helpful to know how much we changed and uh, we can always get back to where we, need, where we started. Hopefully as we make this change, you'll feel that uh, ability for your foot to relax um, more instead of tense up in the, in the power phase. Let's have you paddle. Okay. Feels good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell me, uh, Ryan, can you feel a sense of relaxation in the ankle and in the foot? You know, I kind of do. I haven't been pedaling all that long, but it does. It feels better for sure. Yeah. Nice. And more maybe stability, uh, different pressure away from just on that ball of the foot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You're a mag magician. Or just well trained. Well trained. And so the next thing we're gonna do is uh, add some support to the shoe. So the, all shoes come with no arch support. So we're gonna add some arch support so you can feel how dispersion of pressure over more of the foot feels more comfortable, actually helps relax the foot, and then you can get better glute acti activation and engagement and reduce maybe that over activation of the quad, which creates a lot more knee, knee uh, front of the knee pain. Yeah, I it. definitely have had knee pain. I did a big ride in Sweden last year where my knee hurt a bit. I changed the, you know, the height of the saddle and that seemed to help. So yeah. I'm guessing lots of other people have these problems too, right? Uh, that's correct, yeah. Number one injury is something around the knee. So we're gonna just use a, a medium arch support uh, to help support uh, your foot. Uh, so you've got this nat nice natural amount of arch here. You have a little bit of natural collapse when you're uh, standing and, and walking. So we're just gonna support that foot better. This is just off the shelf, nothing custom in this situation, um, but should help really give him some support. When we look at the stock insole, it might look like it has something here, but really it's very flimsy and flex flexible. And then uh, when we look at one that has more um, support it actually has a rigid area so uh, that's what's actually supporting the arch it also has what's called a metatarsal button so it has something that spreads the toes apart that way where all the blood supply is and nerve supply uh, isn't compressed 
it's all separated by this uh, arch and this plane. Let's put on the shoes. So one key with arch support is that we don't want to over support the foot. Like if you feel like there's this rock in the arch, uh, that's just too much support and that's not what we're after. We're after giving the foot just enough support, giving some proprioception, which is basically this idea that the foot can sense and react to the world and then uh, change the way in which it, you pedal and the way in which you uh, relax into the to pedal stroke. All right. Here we have the support in the shoes now. Next thing we're gonna do is learn how to pedal, and there's a couple different ways we can do that. Uh, one, we can be more quad dominant. So when we are more quad dominant, we tend to tense the foot, toe point more, um, and then that puts more strain around the knees. So if you are noticing some of the knee tension, then maybe check in with your both your posture and with this other pedaling technique, which would be asking your glutes to do some of the work, right? So the glute, big powerful muscle, it extends the, uh, the hip uh, or the femur at the hip, right? So we can actually use that to help uh, engage the, the power phase and get more out of your body as well and reduce how much quad fatigue and how much pressure there is around the front of the knee or inside the joint uh, by getting better glute activation. How do I ask my glute to do the work? Yeah, <laughs> uh, so some of it is checking with posture. So if you have a lot of posterior pelvic tilt and a lot of rounding in your spine, uh, which often, you know, uh, we do at work with um, more computer age and everything's just right in front of us. So learning how to sit up tall. So you're going to have to go back to, you know, your mom always tells you to sit up tall. Yep. So we're going to check in with posture. That requires a bit of anterior pelvic tilt uh, to start with. And then uh, on a bike, you're never just standing, you're never sitting straight up. There's a bit of hinge forward to lean to the front end. So that can really help uh, get into that glute activation just by changing posture. Another thing that we do is just physically ask that muscle to work. So we um, use the, the butt muscle to, to do the work. Um, so we're gonna have you do that, uh, some drills and we're gonna see if we can alter what muscle activation is present. So here's what we're gonna have you do. So I want you to just uh, sit up nice and tall, yeah. nice. And then I want you to think about, now take a deep breath and just relax into that and you can find a posture that feels neutral from there. And then I want you to think about uh, in the downstroke, when you're producing the power, I want you to think about squeezing the glute, right? And using just the glute in that downstroke. So let's, so go ahead and pick up the speed and give that a try. So notice how when you start to do it, can you feel how your ankle gets more passive and you almost drive the heel? Yeah. Yeah, so that is uh, when we add a little more glute activation. And then when you uh, go back to trying to produce the power at the foot pedal interface with a more rigid foot, yeah. and you'll feel that quad activation. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so, I'm more quad, head, more totally. quad dominant. So if you, let's say, you could practice this all the time and just be better at using the glutes, or you could also say, oh, all right, I'm starting to notice my knee, so can I get more into that glute activation? So, you know, you might remember our conversation and like, oh yeah, Ryan told me I need to get into that glute activation to help with my knee. Great, that's another way to help utilize your body, shift the focus or energy somewhere else and change the pattern and change the pain pattern as well. That's awesome. Yeah. I've never even thought of this. <laughs> yep. You can also think about driving the heel for a couple pedal revolutions. Okay. What that does is it helps reset the, the brain and it tells us that our body can be in a new place or our ankle can do a different pattern. Yeah. Now, while you're doing that, uh, don't focus on the ankle so much, but just start to focus on that glute activation. Okay. Let's see if you can do that. So this will be a great technique when you're out on the on the road, or, you know, day in, day out. Maybe you're getting some quad tightness that's creating more knee tension. Uh, this is a great technique to help pull tension and um, uh, energy away from the knee, get into that glute and the hip, and uh, use some other big powerful muscles to produce power and hopefully reduce the knee strain that you might be having. So I am going to try out a new saddle. This is called the Infinity Saddle. A lot of people love this thing. A lot of people have told me they never get saddle sores when they use this. It's actually the official saddle of Race Across America, so we're talking serious endurance riders. I have not used it yet. We're gonna put it on the bike and see how it works. What I'm doing is thinking about, well, where are you sitting on the current saddle? 
which is somewhere back in here where his sit bones are supported well. And so I want uh, on the new saddle, his sit bones to be in here. So we're gonna set the saddle up fairly similar. So we can't use the nose as a guide to say, let's measure saddle setback or nose to something because they're gonna be quite a bit different. Oh yeah. My butt feels happy on this thing. It's got a nice little, kind of cups my butt a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, this particular saddle is very unique in the, in the world of bikes. Definitely was meant for and born out of these like multi-day, uh, long duration events. Um, so yeah, it tends to work for both men and women. So uh, we'll see how it goes. So what are we gonna do now? Um, so just for uh, understanding about saddle height. We talked about that at the very beginning. I want to show you how you can at home uh, manipulate saddle height to even refine for yourself what feels good. Sometimes personal selection and everybody has a different inherent feeling in their body and some might self-select a really too tall of a saddle height and some might uh, self-select something too low. But in general if you start low go too high and just find kind of keep fine tuning uh, a little bit up and down until you find a place that feels comfortable. Um, so for Ryan, we're gonna just go ahead and go now too high so that you understand what it feels like. And we didn't raise it that much. We're talking, uh, a, I don't know, maybe like six, six or seven millimeters. Um, so a little over a quarter of an inch and uh, that should be noticeable and almost too high. Yeah, so now the saddle is pretty darn high and I can feel it immediately. My leg has to extend almost all the way down there. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, so really small change, but really uh, noticeable in the body. So really just finding that sweet spot that uh, feels comfortable and that's just related to your muscle tension and how your muscles function. If it's too high, it can be behind the knee problems, it can be upper hamstring problems, uh, too low, often front of the knee pain. Uh, so those are pretty common symptoms that we might see. Yeah. We want to try a couple options just so we have an idea of uh, or so that really you get an idea of how different saddles contact your body. And the more uh, saddles we try, the more you start to weed out ones that you definitely don't like. So that's the number one goal is that we wanna weed out some ones that you don't like, and then hopefully narrow it down to one or two that you do like, and we'll keep those as a backup plan in case for whatever reason, this one just doesn't quite work. So Ryan, this is the uh, specialized uh, power saddle. Uh, it's in a 143 width, which will fit your sit bones. So you'll sit somewhere uh, squarely on this. Has a lot of uh, soft tissue relief. It's a little bit flatter style saddle. Uh, might feel firmer than your w WTB, but sit bones can adapt to pressure really well, whereas uh, peren perennial pressure does not uh, really adapt. Um, both men and women. That's that's not an area where we want a lot of pressure. No, and so that's why these seats have gaps in the middle. Yeah, yep. So we've got all this space here um, just to help give better blood supply to that tissue. So specialized saddle, it definitely feels firmer than the WTB and the Infinity for sure. Firmness, again, isn't always the, the uh, a problem. If anything, our sit bones get more adapted to it. If the sit bones don't come around, then it's just not the right shape. Um, so sometimes we can have a really firm saddle, it's the right shape and it doesn't even feel firm. Um, and then we can have a really soft saddle that sometimes feels really firm just because it's not the right shape. So uh, there's no exact rhyme or reason. It's more of an interaction between the body and, and the saddle. All right, look at this saddle. Looks like even more of a hole in the middle. Yeah. So this is the uh, Pro Stealth uh, from basically a division of Shimano. And um, we're going to give it a try. This one I just sat on. This one definitely feels pretty... <laughs> Pretty firm, but as you say, not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. So with too soft of a saddle, sometimes our sit bones will actually sink deep into the saddle, which means that the middle part becomes high. And now all of a sudden we're putting more pressure into soft tissue, which is why firmness can actually be a good thing is that it'll help raise our sit bones up above soft tissue um, because we can't sink too deep into it. So I'm on the specialized Mimic right now and I can immediately feel that it just, it feels better. Like right when I got on, I'm like, oh, this one fits my butt right. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's what we're after is that feeling and that helps us weed out the ones that are not good that we don't want to waste time with in the future. This is the Phenom saddle from Specialized. They make two versions. They make a standard version with a normal cutout, just like 
uh, like this saddle that has yeah. a true cutout. This one has a cutout, but they have what's called Mimic technology built in. And so the Mimicry technology is really a technology originally designed for women. And so women's soft tissue can actually swell into a cutout and that can create a hot spot. So they wanted to make this membrane that has a, a softness, but it's, a, it's basically compression of that tissue. So it's not super firm, um, but it'll reduce that over swelling into a cutout for women. Turns out a lot of men like it as well, partly because the nose, they also change the padding to a softer density from the, the from the, where the bone area is up, up uh, where your sit bones are. Let's talk about the cockpit. Yeah, so the cockpit, an area of the bike that a lot of people just uh, ride it how it comes, right? But there are ways that we can manipulate the, the grip and the, so the grip area, the brakes, um, especially on this kind of bike. Uh, that's an area that a lot of people, again, just, just set it and forget it and don't realize that you can change anything. Uh, what we're going to do, Ryan has bigger hands. Uh, we're going to make sure that the, uh, the brake lever isn't too, uh, too far uh, out and he can actually brake better um, and feel more natural. So we're actually going to move everything inward and uh, it's going to feel much more natural on his hand. I'd say ideal world on a mountain bike even if you can start to be a one finger breaker on rougher terrain, then you'll have three fingers on the bar holding the bar. Oh, yeah. um, and brakes are so much more powerful these days. You know, since you're using a lot of weight on the bike, it might feel more natural to have two fingers, um, but I would say test both and see which one you like. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> this does feel better. So Ryan, we're pretty much dialed in, huh? Yeah, we've got this bike uh, ready to go for you. Uh, you're ready to hit Ragbri and any future adventures. <laughs> yeah, man, I can't thank you enough. Totally. It's been fun. And yeah. What if somebody out there doesn't have the ability to get a bike fit? They live in a small town in America. There's no bike shop nearby. What are some of the simple things somebody can do to make their bike more comfortable? Yeah, you can start with just listening to your body. You know, if you jump on the bike, get that first bit of biofeedback and just say, uh, in my gut, you know, is the saddle feel like it's too high, too low? Do I feel like I'm putting too much weight in my hands? Is my neck hurt after, you know, 20 minutes? Or am I going numb on the saddle after 10 minutes? You know, if you're running into some of those issues, then you could always experiment a bit on your own. It might take a little longer, um, but that's starting place. You could try filming yourself from the side, just have a, a friend or just a, you know, tripod set up or whatever and take a little capture, maybe investigate a couple videos. Otherwise, um, uh, seek out your local bike shop or local uh, often there's even fitters who uh, are bike fitters who are independents who don't work out of a bike shop but most bike shops will have some form of fitting even if it's just a basic starting place so um, yeah and as far as saddles cool. there's so many out there they, it can be overwhelming to yeah. try to choose them is it kind of like buying a pair of running shoes you just got to try them all out unfortunately there is a bit of trial and error with a saddle uh, so if you can do like what we did in here um, with you where basically you can try a bunch of saddles in real time that's ideal world and a fitter will also know where to put that saddle so that you're not feeling the saddle in the wrong place versus just the wrong saddle so uh, I think it's more valuable to really work with a fitter because it'll help expedite the process but again if you don't have the resources or you just don't have somebody in your local area then yeah you might just buy a few saddles that you can return online and uh, test them out and then send them back if they don't work all right, thank you so much for watching this video. I wanted to jump in and say that I have been using and sitting on that Infinity saddle since he got this all dialed in back in late July. I rode 500 miles of Ragbri and a few other adventures. And guess what? My butt is very happy. No saddle sores, no hot spots. I still use my cushioned, you know, liners, of course, but I've heard that some people don't even use liners with the Infinity saddle. I don't know if I quite have the guts to do that, um, but maybe I'll give it a shot someday. I, this is not sponsored. I bought this Infinity saddle. It is very expensive. It's made in the USA. You can check them out if you want. It's like 450 bucks. But when I think about it, my health is, is worth that money. I wish I had had this saddle on my bike during the Tour Divide and maybe it would have allowed me to continue. I don't know. I'm gonna keep testing it as I move forward. And as Ryan said, not every seat fits every butt. So go out there and try a whole bunch of different saddles until you find the right one for you.
Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. And if you wanna get your bike all set up and fit, I totally recommend Full Cycle here in Boulder. A lot of you don't live in Boulder, so check out your local bike shop. And you can even use just some of the tips that he gave me and do some of this stuff yourself. So stay tuned for more adventures, and I will see you down the road. And don't forget, get off your couch and get out there.